Anyone who denies that the direct file pilot was a huge success, my guess is, is just living in another universe. It was open to a fairly small percentage of taxpayers, but the reviews it got from its initial users were overwhelmingly positive. It seems like a whole lot of people were very stunned that a federal agency, particularly one as frequently vilified as the IRS, was able to build a helpful website that works. The tens of thousands of taxpayers who used direct file this year collectively saved millions on fees that they would have paid to one of the tax software giants. The website was user friendly. It was quick and easy to use. It didn't hassle users with upcharges for add-on services they didn't need. <clears throat> direct file showed that the IRS could build a good tool that people like because it saves Americans time and money. No surprise then that the people who oppose it are absolutely furious and once again are doing everything they can to stop it from growing. The detractor said it didn't attract enough users, but tens of thousands of new users came in over the last week. The IRS hit its goal of 100,000 taxpayers using the system. There is no doubt in my mind that this will be more popular every year. Others have said that the cost estimates were too vague, but the fact is there's always challenges with pilot programs. Now that the IRS has tested this system and set a baseline, the costs are going to be clear going forward. Finally, there are some who said the whole project was unnecessary. They've said that taxpayers have the option of using free file systems through the big tax prep companies. They may have had a valid argument years ago because before the tax prep giants got caught hiding free file options from eligible taxpayers. They were conning people into forking over hundreds of dollars they didn't need to spend. Congress simply cannot go around trusting the big tax prep companies to do the right thing. For some of them, their version of free file is the freedom for Americans to pay them even more. Bottom line, direct file is long overdue and it's the kind of public service the federal government ought to be providing to Americans whenever it can. I understand the IRS and Treasury Department are now evaluating how the pilot program went over the last few months. Personally, I believe that this program should be expanded. I'm looking forward to the day when Oregonians come up to me in one of our 51 Fred Meyer grocery stores. I have been to every single one of them, having had a chicken in each one to tell me how thrilled they were to save time and money with direct file. On the topic of vastly improved federal programs, I'll turn now to the IRS's continued success in improving customer service during the filing season. The IRS answered a million more calls with live assistance than it did during last year's filing season. It got call waiting times down to three minutes. It saved taxpayers 1.4 million hours of time than in previous years they would have spent basically listening to all the music and just being on hold. It smashed its goals for in-person service. Despite this success, apparently there have been some complaints from the other side of the aisle that the administration is asking for money to sustain this progress. I'm not sure what's behind that. Maybe they want to go back to the bad old days when taxpayers sat on hold for hours and couldn't get timely refunds. Doesn't make any sense to me. For the second filing season in a row, the IRS is proving that it can provide a top-notch level of taxpayer service when Congress gives it the resources. Just a few words to close on enforcement. The IRS has announced some major enforcement efforts in the last few months. This includes cracking down on 125,000 cases where wealthy individuals, many of them people who bring in more than a million dollars a year, never even filed a tax return. Let me repeat this. This is not people who figure out how to game the system. They are sufficiently contemptuous of the rules that they never even filed a tax return. There's also a new effort to root out the abuse of tax breaks for corporate jets, high-flying executives who take tax write-offs for personal travel, for example. And in my view, the IRS ought to look at similar abuses with corporate-owned yachts. When it comes to yachts, the abuses seem to me to be even more blatant. Yachts produce big write-offs, but I find it hard to believe that anybody <clears throat> is yachting to a board meeting. If Congress continues to cut the IRS's funding, or if the Inflation Reduction Act funding expires and Congress doesn't add more, we know exactly what will happen. Wealthy tax cheats will have an easier time getting away 
with breaking the law. And that means misery for typical Americans who are just trying to do their civic duty when tax filing season comes around every spring. That's an outcome that the vast majority of the American people oppose. Lots to discuss this morning, colleagues. Uh, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Werfel for joining us. I look forward to the question and answer, Senator Crapo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome again, Commissioner Werfel. Uh, I agree and appreciate with the work that you're doing and the progress that you have made. There are going to be issues that I raise today, however. The IRS needs to be accountable for the choices it makes, become more efficient, rigorously plan, provide full transparency and timely solicit real feedback from informed stakeholders like Congress before acting. Despite claims that the $80 billion in new funding would transform the IRS into a 21st century agency, the President's budget request indicates otherwise. While modest progress has been made, there are other areas where the agency continues to miss the mark. For example, last year, I raised concerns with the IRS strategic operating plan, including its vagueness and missing line item cost projections. A year later, we are still missing important details. Yet this year's budget asks for even more unprecedented IRS funding, more than $104 billion. This underscores that the initial windfall was not a cure. The IRS has not transformed, and the President believes the only way that that vision can be achieved is to spend more. While I support a transformed IRS, this approach is not the solution. For $80 billion, one would expect the transformational customer service changes and fully modern front-end and back-end IT. Instead, it seems that taxpayers have paid for mail to actually be opened and a decline in the phone wait times. Meanwhile, several million items of taxpayer correspondence remain unanswered and half a million ID theft cases remain unresolved, on average, years later. IT modernization funding is also scheduled to run out years before the IRS finishes updating its systems. I assume that this is due in part to the bulk of the IRA funding being directed to enforcement. I don't disagree with the enforcement needs that my colleague, the chairman, has identified. An emblematic example of the just spend more, no questions asked approach, though, is the direct file program. Despite there already being multiple free filing programs, I say that again, multiple free filing programs offered by the IRS, the agency embarked on a redundant government-run tax preparation project complete with all attendant inefficiencies and conflicts of interest. Just last week, uh, the, the Government Accountability Office reported a highlight of many ways the supposed pilot program has not followed best practices, including key planning, budgeting, and accountability failures. The report noted that while GAO could not determine how much the program has and will cost to operate, the IRS, having not provided sufficient information to do this, the current tab far exceeds $100 million just th through fiscal year 2024 for an option that might only serve 100,000 taxpayers this year. In contrast, the federal government spends less than $5 million a year to have two to three million taxpayers served in one of its free income tax preparation programs. Were the IRS to use this year's direct file spending to pay third-party providers to prepare and file returns instead, literally hundreds of times the number of taxpayers could file for free. The IRS spending hundreds of millions of its finite funding to simply test the utility of doing something that can already be done more efficiently with better outcomes and without the very real conflicts while simultaneously pleading for more funding, calls for more oversight. Direct file is not my only concern with the IRS's current path. 
Other serious concerns include the continued IRS use of biased data and post facto metrics to plan and justify its actions. Indiscriminate IRS enforcement campaigns that pressure honest taxpayers and waste government resources. And the IRS's continued and highly disproportionate focus on increasing enforcement over improving taxpayer services. Commissioner Werfel, while I appreciate the positive steps the IRS has taken during your tenure, so much remains undone at the IRS that any victory lap is unwarranted. I look forward to your testimony, Commissioner Werfel, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, our witness today is Commissioner Daniel I. Werfel, 50th Commissioner of the IRS. Previously was a managing director and partner of the Boston Consulting Group. Before joining uh, them, uh, he was nominated to be the controller of the Office of Management and Budget, a post he served in for four years before becoming acting commissioner of the IRS in 2013. He began his career at the Office of Management and Budget in 1997 and was a policy analyst in the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Commissioner, welcome. Please go ahead. Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the filing season and the IRS budget. I'm pleased to report that the 2024 tax season opened on schedule on January 29th, and we've seen a historic filing season unfold since then. Through April 6th, the IRS received more than 101.8 million individual income tax returns and issued nearly 66.8 million refunds for more than $201.1 billion. The Inflation Reduction Act funding has enabled the IRS to have one of its best filing seasons ever in terms of customer service. Taxpayers are seeing a difference. We've answered over 1 million more taxpayer calls than we did a year ago and 3 million more calls than we did in 2022. Wait times and level of service on our main phone lines have improved. We've dramatically expanded service in our walk-in sites, increasing hours and serving more taxpayers and new and expanded tools on irs.gov are seeing heavy use. We had several ambitious transformation goals at the start of filing season, and IRS employees worked hard to deliver. Here are some examples through early April. We committed to an 85% level of phone service on our main taxpayer helpline during the filing season. As of early April, we've exceeded that goal at 88%. That's a huge improvement from 2022 when only 15% of callers could connect and receive support from a live assister. We committed to an average call wait time of five minutes or less on the agency's main taxpayer helpline. We exceeded that goal with our main line phones being answered in about three minutes. These are some of the examples of how we're seeing historic improvements in taxpayer service, and the agency is rebounding from some very tough and lean years during the past decade. At the same time, the Inflation Reduction Act funding has enabled us to begin making critical inroads in addressing tax evasion amongst the most complex and largest filers. This is a sharp turnaround from the past decade when we were hindered by a lack of resources. Our compliance work includes focusing on tax delinquency and non-filing among high-income individuals, areas we are particularly concerned about. We are also responsibly leveraging artificial intelligence and hiring subject matter experts to find tax evasion amongst the largest and most complex partnerships and corporations. I wanna be clear. Despite the improvements this tax season, the IRS has still much more work to do on many fronts. This includes closing remaining gaps on phone service, expanding digital options for all taxpayers, further strengthening data security, and supporting vulnerable populations by protecting them from scams and increasing access to the earned income tax credit and other refundable credits. Our ongoing success hinges on sustained investments to make sure that we have the right size workforce with the right training and tools, as well as modern technology infrastructure with increasingly modern web-enabled tools for taxpayers. These are needed to ensure the IRS continues our transformation work to serve the nation today and in the future. 
Helping us in these efforts is the administration's fiscal year 2025 budget proposal. It gives us flexibility and increases IRS transfer authority so all available resources can be used efficiently and effectively. It will also help sustain a new IRS baseline of resources and avoid immediate funding cliffs that would dramatically degrade our ability in many different areas, including the service improvements that taxpayers saw this filing season. The 2025 funding is necessary for us to, mill, to build on our successes this filing season and continue our work to, for example, make further phone service improvements and provide digital tools to help taxpayers. For the IRS to be able to do all these things, adequate annual discretionary funding and complementary long-term mandatory funding are both essential. Finally, I wanna publicly thank taxpayers for taking the time to file and pay their taxes this filing season. This is a critical component that citizens do to support our great nation. Please know that all of us at the IRS deeply appreciate and respect the time and care taxpayers take to do this vital civic duty and IRS employees remain committed to helping taxpayers in any way that we can. Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and members of the committee, that concludes my statement. I would be happy to take your questions. Commissioner, thank you, and uh, we very much appreciate your being here. So you have experience in both the public and the private sector, and it seems to me that launching something like Direct File is a little bit like starting a startup company. Tell us from a business perspective, how has this project launch gone? It's gone very well. I think of it as a product launch. We're putting a new product on the street, if you will, and our customers, in this case taxpayers, are gonna let us know uh, if the product is working effectively and if they think they would like to use the product in the future. So we started like any private sector company would we had the idea for the product, and then we put it on the street with volunteers. We tested it. So from about January 29th to March 8th, the, uh, the direct file product was in testing with volunteer taxpayers who agreed to submit. We got very positive reviews, but we were also to make, able to make real-time fixes to the product based on taxpayer experience. On March 8th, we were ready to go. And that's when we made it publicly available to, uh, to the millions of taxpayers in 19 states that were eligible this year. The feedback has been great. People are telling us that it's easy to use, it's simple. Of course, they like the price tag, it's free. And as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, in the final days of the filing season, we saw an extraordinary increase in the pace of taxpayers filing with direct file, and it all went very smoothly. Okay, let's talk about the massive fraud that we're seeing now in the employee retention tax credit program. And as we all know, this was of real help to lots of people during the pandemic, but a whistleblower told me not too long ago that there's now an avalanche of fraud, something like 95% of the claims now being made are uh, fraudulent, choking the IRS uh, systems and delaying valid um, refunds. Now, the bipartisan tax bill that I introduced with Chairman Jason Smith over in the House would cut off the claims after January 31, 2024 and give the agency new enforcement tools. My question to you is, if this Senate fails to take action on this bipartisan tax agreement. It seems to me that fraudulent ERTC claims are gonna to continue to clog the system. That's gonna cost taxpayers billions of dollars, and it's gonna divert resources away from law-abiding taxpayers. Your thoughts? Yeah, I absolutely agree, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, we issued a moratorium on September 14th, 2023, because over the summer of 2023, we were seeing an increasing number of questionable claims coming in. And we were worried, not just about the financial bottom line of the US government, 
We were worried about honest small businesses that we saw were being taken advantage of by uh, aggressive marketers and promoters convincing these small businesses that they were eligible for a credit they weren't truly eligible for. And they were saying, you can get this credit at no risk to you, and that wasn't true. So it was also false advertising. So we had to take steps to stop the flow, and we did slow it. But even today, Mr. Chairman, we are still getting 20,000 new claims every week, even when we announced in September that we stopped processing. This is because the law allows these claims to be submitted through 2025, and these promoters are out there still pushing for these claims to be filed. I really do appreciate the legislation that you're sponsoring with uh, Chairman Smith in the House that would give us the tools. There's two things being harmed if that bill doesn't get passed. One, the financial bottom line of the US government, because you're giving us tools to crack down on fraud, and two, in our big inventory of claims, there are still eligible claims in the midst, but they're very hard to find. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. And so with your help, we can get those eligible claims found and issued and hold back from issuing the ineligible claims. Well, I, I talked to Chairman Smith late last night, and he wanted me to say, we are pulling out all the stops to get this legislation you know, passed. And if I were to go through all of the groups conservative groups, progressive groups, and other groups who are for this legislation, we'd still have you here tomorrow morning at breakfast. So I'm not going to do that, but we're pulling out all the stops to get this passed. Last question I wanted to ask deals with IRA funding and customer service. Uh, the funding provided by the IRA uh, this filing season seems to have been a major success. The IRS cut call wait times to three minutes, expanded the customer callback service, opened or reopened 54 sites for in-person service, there are new digital tools, and you scan millions of paper filed returns. That ought to speed up some refunds. Commissioner, how will taxpayers notice that IRA funding has improved service this year, A, and B, so we get this in, what would taxpayers notice if the funding were cut? Well, taxpayers, I believe, and have heard from them, has saw and felt a big difference in the past two years, and in particular this year. We are putting Inflation Reduction Act fund to good use to serve taxpayers. How? We now have the right number of phone assisters in our phone center. They're trained. They're answering the phone calls at peak efficiency. The wait time is down to three minutes. And we used IRA funding to modernize our call center with things that taxpayers want, like a callback option and like more chatbots and automated solutions so you don't have to wait on the phone if what you can get done with the IRS can be done by pressing a button or speaking out loud. So these are things that taxpayers are seeing and feeling and is making a difference. We also are using uh, Inflation Reduction Act funding to update irs.gov with new tools. There are things that people can do on their individual online accounts now, updates to where's my refund. We had over 500 million hits to irs.gov this year. It's a record for us. And we believe that's because we've updated it with tools that taxpayers are finding useful. Like for example, being able to submit documentation to the IRS electronically rather than on paper at the post office. So all of that needs to be sustained. And this is what's critical about our budget proposal. Our bu budget proposal is not saying we need a lot more money to get the job done. We have gotten, for example, the service to an extraordinarily high level. The money we're asking for in the out years of the president's budget is to sustain. We don't want to lose those 5,000 new assisters. We don't, want, we don't want to have to fire them or lay them off. That means that phone calls won't get answered. So the funding that we're asking for is making sure that we can sustain the right size customer service workforce and the right tools so this new service level that we've achieved can be sustained into the future. I'm over my time. Senator Crapo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Commissioner Werfel, the first issue I want to talk with you about is identity theft case resolution. Yes. I assume you're aware we have some significant issues with that in Idaho. I think they're existing all across the country. According to data provided by your staff, on average, it is currently taking the IRS almost two years to resolve ID theft cases flagged by taxpayers to the IRS. Your staff also indicates that the IRS currently, currently has a backlog of almost 600,000 such cases. 
During the time a taxpayer awaits the IRS resolving a case, many negative outcomes can occur, including the IRS itself taking actions that could harm the already victimized taxpayers, such as imposing liens or levies. As a sign of how pervasive and troubling these cases are, I'm aware of instances where state and local governments have reached out to Congress to assist with their own ID theft cases. Now, I'm not asking you to comment today on any particular case, though my staff has been in touch with you and your staff with regard to some of these. Speaking generally to all of the cases, I'm concerned and certain that you would agree that taking years to identify and resolve victim, uh, ID theft victims' claims and problems is unacceptable, and that both the delinquent resolution time and the sheer volume of the backlog needs to be improved rapidly. Would you agree to provide me your responses no later uh, than your responses to the committee's other questions uh, on record, a report detailing the concrete steps that the IRS will hereafter take to quickly and thoroughly resolve these unresolved ID theft cases, as well as an analysis of the reasons why there are so many of these cases in the first place? Yes, absolutely. We will commit to that. Well, I appreciate that. And this is something that really needs to hi be highly prioritized. Uh, the next issue that I would like to go to with you is uh, basically the direct file and what I see as a lack of transparency regarding the way that it's been managed. When you last testified before this committee, I raised concerns with the wasteful and duplicative direct file program that at the time the IRS was allegedly only studying. You assured me then that no decision has been made on moving forward with the direct file. A week later, you told House Ways and Means Committees members that you would produce a study and then you would come back and talk about it with Congress. Uh, what happened is that the very same day you issued your study, which both GAO and TIGTA have since flagged as missing key information and analysis, you announced that the IRS was going to do direct file. Putting aside policy concerns with respect to direct file, my question for you is, do you believe that the IRS has statutory authority to implement a direct file program? I do. And what is that authority? We have uh, authorities under the Internal Revenue Code to provide taxpayer service to taxpayers and update the, the tools and the solutions that taxpayers uh, use to file. So we lived in a world where we had only paper forms. Then we moved to a world where, for example, we can put a PDF form on the web and people can fill out that PDF form on the web. We didn't need congressional authority to do that. We worked to develop, uh, as you mentioned in your opening statement, a partnership with, uh, with the Free File Alliance with commercial software providers to add and work with them and support their efforts to support free electronic solutions. We didn't need con congressional authority to do that. And now we stand here where we are hearing from taxpayers, not every taxpayer, but some taxpayers, that they want an additional option. They want an additional, they have paper, they can go on a PDF file in, on the web. They can work with a com commercial software provider. We didn't, IRS didn't ask for legislative authority. Now there's just yet another option on the menu. And it's our assessment that we have the authority to add such options on the menu. Maybe there's another option that's gonna come after direct file. Again, this is about the IRS working with taxpayers, serving their best interest, and making sure we're giving them options to make their life less stressful and easier as they file their taxes. Well, I'll pursue this with you more later. I only have time for one last question, and I, and I need to get this question in. Uh, this is the budget request for another $104 billion. Yep. Uh, you stated before that the IRS would have a decade to rebuild with the $80 billion in IRS funding. And there would be a healthy pressure to immediately take the funds and demonstrate what a well-funded IRS means. At the time when many of us raised concerns about that level of funding, which was five times or more of the budget of the IRS, uh, it was stated, well, we need that money to maintain these employees. Now I'm understanding that we need the $104 billion more to maintain the employees of the IRS. I guess part of my question could be, when will it stop? But my question is, 
now that the IRS has requested an additional more than eight times its annual budget for more new mandatory multi-year spending, when is it going to end? What is the actual amount of doubling, tripling, multiplying the size of the IRS budget in order to accomplish whatever the objectives you say can't be accomplished with what has been provided? When will we see the end yeah. of the amount of phenomenal multiplications of the size of the IRS in budget requests? Yeah, I'm glad you asked the question, uh, Senator. Um, I'd like to take a moment just to explain our, our budget as quickly and easily as I can. We have a base budget, and then we have a modernization budget. And our base budget is too small to serve the tax system that we have today. Our base budget is roughly the same as it was in 2010. And the tax system has grown in a variety of different ways. More filers, a gig economy, um, more complexity, thousands of changes to the tax code. So as the tax system grows and our base budget stays constant, we have to rely on the modernization funds to close that gap. And so what we're asking for in the funding is to basically create a new baseline. So as the tax system continues to grow, we have the right setup to run the train schedules that are, that are created by that tax code. It's not about asking for more and more and more money to build an ever-increasing IRS. It's about achieving a baseline. Because what happens in the out years is all the money goes away. So if you look at 2026, we lose all of our ability to maintain services. If you look at 2028 and 2029, we lose all of our ability to maintain technology because there's a cliff. So that money that you're describing as of concern is really just intended to address the cliffs in the out years. And so that when taxpayers came to us this year and we were able to answer close to nine out of 10 of their calls in three minutes time, what the president's budget is saying is, please make sure that same result exists in 2026, 27, 28, and 29. That's all the president's budget is asking So for. a new baseline that is 800% the existing baseline? It's not 800%. I would say it's, you know, it's, clo in, 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 it's different in services than it is in operations. But currently, we are about 2 to $3 billion a year off of our services baseline, as an example. And by the way, the tax system continues to grow. So I can show you all the math and work with your team on that, but, but I, want, I want to be clear that the increased money is really a combination of making sure that we can provide digital tools to taxpayers, but also just run the train schedules that we have today and overcome these cliffs that are coming. Thank you. Okay, Senator Carper, then followed by Senator Grassley. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks so much. Uh, I think it was 14 months ago that uh, you sat at this table, and uh, behind you was not uh, your leadership team from the IRS, but uh, your, uh, your wife, uh, your kids, uh, your parents. And, uh, and I thank them at the time for sharing you with, uh, with all of us and uh, just convey to them um, I still feel that way. And I'm encouraged by the, the leadership that you're providing. Um, I, I want to say to my colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle, but uh, some, some of us uh, previously served as governor. The, in Delaware, we don't have an IRS. We have a Delaware Division of Revenue. We used to provide lousy service, and uh, we didn't uh, do a very good job collecting taxes that were owed, and we went to work on that. We didn't fix it in, uh, in a year. Uh, we didn't even fix it in uh, one term, uh, but we fixed it in eight years. And, the, uh, after I stepped down, the year that I stepped down as governor of the state of Delaware, Delaware Division of Revenue, earn and receive the quality award for service among all the businesses, nonprofits in the state of Delaware. The quality award from the, is like, are you kidding? No, we're not. We've learned to provide great service. We learned to do a better job of collecting the revenues that were owed, and we balanced our budgets eight years in a row in large part because we had done that. And so it can be done. It can't be done overnight. It can't be done without uh, support. Uh, and it can't be done without leadership. Thank you for providing that leadership. I am... Um, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about direct file, if we, if, if we can. Direct file program, we talked about it already, but a major uh, step toward improving the taxpayer experience. And this year, taxpayers in, I think, 12 states could uh, directly file with the IRS through direct file. And I look forward to working, we look forward to working with you and your team to build on the success of this year's pilot to bring a direct file to taxpayers in all 50 states, including the first state of Delaware. Question, 
Uh, Commissioner Werfel, does the IRS plan on continuing the direct file program for next uh, filing uh, tax filing season? And uh, do you f plan on expanding the scope of the program for the next filing season? And if so, how? Senator, as we sit here today, direct file pilot is still ongoing because Massachusetts is one of our pilot states. And because of Patriot's Day, they have until April 17th to file. So the pilot isn't done yet. Here's the plan. Once the pilot is complete, we will gather the data, and we've already started gathering the data, and we will report out publicly the information, including cost. And uh, Senator Crapo mentioned in his uh, remarks uh, cost estimate uh, that uh, that may exceed $100 million. I'm not seeing that in some of the early data that's coming and not even close to that. So I'm looking forward to having a public discussion around what we saw, what the demand was, what the performance of the product was, and what the and what the cost was once the pilot wraps up, and we're, you know, a couple of days away from that. Once we can get that information out into the public space, I would expect we're going to hear from some stakeholders, and we're going to hear from taxpayers, and we're going to hear from states, and we're going to hear from members of this committee and members from House Ways and Means, and then we'll make a decision. Uh, I'll consult with Secretary Yellen, and we'll make a decision about the future of direct file. The results have been encouraging. There was significant demand for the product. We, when, when we released it on March 8th to the broader public, we anticipated at that time, based on traffic, that we would see about 100,000 uh, users by April 15th. We, we blasted through 100,000 uh, on April 13th or 14th, and, and we're still getting more returns in. So, so demand exceeded what we thought the day we launched the product uh, widely. Um, and then in terms of cost, we're still gathering information, but I don't see anything in the data, early data, that points to over-exorbitant costs. But again, we want to have that public discussion, and then we want to make a decision as transparently as we can. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to stick with this uh, direct file for just another moment, if I could. Uh, how can Congress, how can we on this side of the dais, support the direct file program and ensure that more states, including my state, uh, can participate next year? Yeah, I think it's about like making sure there's balanced information out there about what the ambition of direct file is. It's, it's intended to be an option, not intended to be mandatory. Uh, it's still uh, taxpayers preparing their own taxes. It's not the IRS preparing the taxes for you. It's, it's that people can opt out of it anytime they want and switch uh, products. And we want to hear from taxpayers in Delaware and other states more broadly, what do they want from the IRS to make the tax filing process as seamlessly and easy as possible? How can we reduce their stress? A lot of taxpayers are telling us a free solution to work direct with the IRS online is one option we'd like to have. We might not use it, but we want, we want it on the menu. We want to hear from, from your uh, citizens in Delaware what they think so that we can be ever more informed in how we serve taxpayers most effectively. Good, thanks. Mr. Chairman, when you and I were uh, House members a million years ago, and Senator, Senator Grassley was a House member as well, we used to hold a lot of town hall meetings in our respective states. And I remember every, every year, right around uh, tax filing season, I would host uh, uh, up and down the state. We only have three counties, but in every county, we would bring in the Division of Revenue, we'd bring in the IRS. We would help people file their taxes, prepare their taxes. And we would actually have a, a, a do an exercise where we'd try about people in the audience could help us balance the budget. And it was very interesting, and we'd have like 50 or 100 people there. One year, we're having a hard time, like my group was having a hard time, as citizens were having a hard time balancing the budget, and, and they were to work with on defense spending, non-defense spending, we worked on entitlements, and still couldn't balance the budget in the exercise. A lady in the back of the room raised her hand, and I said, yes, ma'am, and she said, um, uh, we're having a hard time, do you have any thoughts? And I said, well, you, you haven't thought at all about revenues in trying to get us to, to this. Revenues are part of the solution. And it's not just raising tax rates and so forth, it's making sure that people who have an income, that they're paying their fair share. The lady in the back of the room, she said, I don't mind paying, uh, I don't mind paying even more taxes. I just want to make sure that everybody else is paying their fair share. Right. And that's what we're trying to do here. We're, Happy for, we're, thank we're, you for helping we're, us with that. We're gonna, we're gonna move on, but don't think you're really retiring. We're gonna call on you for counsel. Senator thank Grassley. You. Yeah. 
you know that I spend a lot of time listening to whistleblowers throughout the bureaucracy, so let me speak about, uh, on, I know on July the 21st, uh, 2023, IRS Supervisor uh, Special Agent Gary Shapley emailed you asking that you direct senior IRS leadership to stop retaliating against him. On May the 18th last year, IRS Special Agent Joseph Ziegler emailed you to disclose his concerns about the IRS handling of a case that he was working on. Um, and uh, I have an opportunity to talk to these. So I know that they've asked to meet with you, what they want to discuss with you. I would assume they want to tell you what's wrong within uh, handling of certain cases. And I would think you at the top of the IRS would want to listen to them. So I'm not going to ask you a question, but I'm going to uh, do now what I told them I would do. I was going to ask you to meet with the two of them and uh, just listen to them. Uh, whether you take action or not is up to you, but I think you ought to at least listen to them. I think uh, whistleblowers throughout government are some of the most patriotic people I know and uh, I would ask you to, to do that. Now I want to go to my first question. Uh, the IRS whistleblower program, which you know I was involved in getting enacted, that's brought $6 billion into the federal government. It's been a pretty effective and efficient program. Uh, but we have this problem of the average wait time uh, for people to get, uh, a, uh, get their case closed has gotten longer and is now up to 10 years. The long average wait time is in part due to the IRS policy against paying partial awards. Under this policy, the IRS will wait years until all the years of uh, claims are completed to pay anything whatsoever. Effectively, the IRS has created barriers to pay awards on its own that are not in the whistleblower statute passed by Congress. So you need to examine the unnecessary policy in the IRS uh, revenue manual and work to allow partial awards to be paid to whistleblowers as quickly as possible. Uh, could you do that? Senator, I'm glad you asked the question uh, between the, the question that uh, Senator Crapo asked on identity theft backlogs and your question on the backlog on our whistleblower claims. You're pointing to two very high priorities as we move forward. As I said in my opening statement, we've had a good filing season, but we have a lot more work to do. And these are two areas. I will commit to, you have, that is an interesting uh, recommendation on, on, on partial payments and the way we can potentially accelerate how whistleblowers who are providing such valuable information to us get their, uh, their, their fair share of the, of the money that they saved for the American taxpayer. So we will look into that and I will get back to you. And also since I didn't get an opportunity, uh, Senator Crapo, I will get back to you on identity theft, another big priority and a big uh, issue that we have to do better at. Uh, I'm glad that uh, whoever makes arrests for people that violate the law in IRS, uh, uh, because uh, this one contractor is now serving five years for disclosing information, but I kind of wonder how an activist like him who wants to be contracted, who presumably got a job for the sole purpose of uh, making public uh, information about taxpayers, in this case, I guess he was after Trump's tax returns. How was an activist with plans to steal taxpayer information able to get hired and gain access to taxpayer information and what action has the IRS taken to ensure an active employee or contractor is never again able to access and share sensitive taxpayer information? Now, thank you for the question. Protecting taxpayer information from the unauthorized access is an absolutely solemn responsibility to the IRS. The individual you reference betrayed the trust of the IRS and the American people. It's a betrayal that cannot be tolerated. And based on what played out in court, it is not being tolerated as this bad actor uh, was current, was brought to justice and will be serving a five-year term in prison. 
from my first day on the job back in March of 23, it is a top priority to strengthen the data security at the IRS. And we have taken numerous steps to address this, working with TIGDA uh, to make sure that, uh, that we have their to-do list aligned with our to-do list. Fewer users, more robust encryption, stronger oversight, better access logs, less removable media, tighter email controls, new printer controls. All of this is, uh, is ongoing and being put in place to make sure that this type of unauthorized access by a contractor, in this case it was a contractor, or an IRS employee can never happen again. There's always going to be that risk. What you try to do is, is narrow the risk to, to as small as it possibly can be. Uh, insider threats and, and unauthorized access from insider threats, it's impossible to, 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 to get rid of completely but I am committed to reducing the probability to as small as it can be by, by putting in the sweat equity to close all those gaps. Com Commissioner, I'm Senator Grassley's a partner on the whistleblower effort, have been for years. I very much support the fact that you're gonna make those issues about whistleblowers um, that Senator Grassley mentioned a priority going forward. I'll be working with our colleague from Iowa as I, I will. Senator Brennan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And uh, Commissioner Werfel, thank you for, for being here. I, I am uh, considering taking a political risk this morning, which is to use the words good news and the IRS in the same sentence. Uh, but I think there's something that I, I really want to call out at a moment when there is a lack of confidence among the American people and our governing institutions, and particularly in the deployment of technology by, um, by uh, government agencies. I'm going through that misery myself as the American people are with what the Department of Education has failed to do on the FAFSA form, a form that Lamar Alexander and I worked for years and years and years to try to improve. And now the American people are having to struggle with the you know absolute disaster that that has become in terms of implementation. And I have to say, it appears to me that the IRS's direct file effort um, uh, may be a model of government technology implementation. That certainly has been the experience of people in Colorado. I know that there are around 100,000 Americans who have used this to, to file their returns. I hope many more states are gonna have the, benefit, the chance to participate going forward you know, there are a lot of Coloradans that have interest in, in using this tool going forward. So I just could wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you were able to, to successfully deploy this, uh, Commissioner, and, and what do you think made the direct file effort successful, if it was, um, that we could learn from in other um, technological implementations across the federal government. And I apologize for that sounding like such a ridiculously softball question, but it's such a rare occurrence that I thought it was important to give yeah. you the chance to talk about no, it. No, and I appreciate that. And look, I am uh, proud of, of, of what we're able to accomplish this filing season. I'm proud of the success of the direct file pilot. I also acknowledge that there's a lot more work to do. And as I look across the IRS, there are areas where, where we can learn from the success of the direct file and our own technology operations and our own management success, and I'm going to learn from it as well. Um, I think uh, first, uh, big big decision we made was not to go too big and to make sure that we focused on what I'll call executional certainty. We could have tried to release direct file to way more states and to have way more taxpayers eligible to use it in this first year. But what we decided to do was find that right first step where, it, where we could test uh, the, the interest, the demand, the user experience, the cost, but not try to, you know, to hit a home run uh, at our first at bat. Uh, and so we went out to 12 states and based on the way we scoped it, 19 million people were eligible. We could have scoped it a lot bigger. We also, we waited until March 8th. Filing season started January 29th. We could have gotten excited and said, let's release this to everyone first day of filing season to try to really um, kind of drive a, a, bigger, a bigger impact. But we wanted to take weeks 
working with, with a small number of volunteer taxpayers to see how their experience was, to work out any bugs. Anytime you do something for the first time, there are gonna be mistakes. So lots of testing, lots of um, uh, prioritizing executional success versus the big splash. And, uh, and I think also uh, we worked across government. This, this was done not by IRS alone. We had a lot of help from, uh, from people at GSA uh, in 18F, and we had a lot of help from the US Digital Service in particular, um, who brought agile technology, product expertise. They worked side by side in a team room at IRS headquarters. It was inspiring to visit that team room, see the energy and excitement, and see different parts of the government working together uh, so well. But ultimately, and this is a little geeky, it's, it was agile technology that was the eye opener. Uh, there's a whole discipline around how you move more quickly to deliver incremental functionality, how you strip through bureaucracy and get decisions made more quickly, that you take calculated risks more regularly. And, and the IRS is no different. Federal agencies tend to not be agile when they do technology. That's why you hear about projects taking five, six, seven years. Here, by sizing this in an increment, an increment that had impact, we were able to be more agile, have executional certainty, and launch something that we can all learn from. Where direct file goes from here, we're not ready to announce that. But one thing's for sure, taxpayers had a positive experience with it, and we all learned a lot from this experience. And I think my, my colleague, and I would just say to him, I don't think in the history of the Finance Committee we have ever heard anyone give an eloquent explanation of incremental technology, or, excuse me, incremental functionality. So uh, we very much appreciate it. Had to start somewhere. <laughs> you did. You got the points on the board. Senator Whitehouse. Thanks very much, Chairman, and thanks, Commissioner, for being here. Um, first of all, let me just echo what Senator Bennett said. I meet pretty regularly with my taxpayer advocate in Rhode Island, and she has seen her workload expedited so quickly as the caseload that she carries to help Rhode Island constituents has been able to move much more rapidly and successfully through the IRS in the wake of the funding. So you have a uh, fan who can show real results from the uh, work you've done to simplify and speed things up at the IRS. Um, the topic I want to raise with you is one I've raised before, and that's the problem of 501c3 and 501c4 enforcement. Uh, my view is that um, when the Supreme Court performed its Citizens United decision, that unleashed enormous amounts of money into the political system and made it for the first time a very significant and consequential thing to be able to hide who the donors were. Once you've got tens of millions of dollars to donate, it's a whole different game than if it's thousands of dollars. So they went straight to work, and the first area was the 501c4s. I will concede that the IRS did kind of a fumble of the way it handled that, but at the same time, the problem was real. And when people started looking into the abuse of 501c4s, um, there was a massive right-wing pushback using what I call the faux outrage machine, and the next thing you know, your predecessor was being threatened with impeachment. His assistant was being referred to the Department of Justice for criminal prosecution. And since then, literally billions of dollars have flowed through 501c4s. There are at least two areas in which there seem to be a lot of ongoing violations. One is the planned cycling of money through 501c4s where you get four related 501c4s sitting around the table and the first one takes 50% of the money and sends it to the super PAC and the second one takes 50% of the 50% and sends it to the super PAC and the third takes 50% of the 25% and sends it to the super PAC and by the time you're done with the fourth one you've got more than 90% of the money going straight into politics contrary to the rule of 50% which I think was a sloppy rule to begin with but Taking it as a given, it's being, this is a really cheesy end around, and I don't see any effort at enforcing it. The second is that now the state of the art in political influence is a 501c3 and a 501c4 that are virtually indistinguishable. And as best I can tell, there's no effort whatsoever to pierce the corporate veil or investigate whether a 501c3 and a 501c4 are legitimately staying in their lanes when they share the same staff, the same office, the same address, the same donors, the same boards, all of that. 
So I would really urge you to take a look at this. It is the Wild West out there, and it's the Wild West of non-enforcement. And I know that you guys took a hell of a beating, and I know that the Obama administration didn't stand up for the organization back then, but at some point the sheriff has to put his boots off the table and on the ground and go out and clean up the, uh, clean up the town, and we badly need it cleaned up. Senator, I want to make sure we get, we get to the right answers on uh, an, an effective following of the appropriate rules for 501c3 and 501c4. Um, look, between 20, fiscal year 2020 and 2023, the IRS worked 100 unique cases uh, under our political campaign uh, intervention program. Uh, is that enough? Uh, no. Uh, there's more work to be done. Uh, when I describe uh, what the Inflation Reduction Act funds enable us to do, it enables us to make investments to spot complexity and to uh, address complexity. That complexity often happens in multinational corporations, offshore tax havens, all of that. But there's also complexity in the tax-exempt space as well. The situation with tax exempt, as you uh, very clearly outlined, is fraught with, with risk and delicate decisions that need to be made. Because if you, inf there are, there are, there are, let's say there are 10 different paths for how you move forward and enforce. Eight of them, you can, you can step in a pothole and really mess it up. So you have to be really, really cautious in terms of how we scale our enforcement efforts. So there's no sense ever that there's any uh, uh, politics uh, in IRS operations that we're doing things above board, nonpartisan, and we're tackling this issue in a way that's, uh, that's above any reproach. Um, well, if, if, you're, yeah. if your goal here is not to enforce the law but to avoid reproach, then people who don't want you to enforce the law can use strategic reproach to try to keep you from enforcing the law. Well, we want to make sure that we're building trust uh, with citizens. And so I'm ready to, to roll up sleeves and work with you on how do we build off the 100 cases we've launched, ramp up our enforcement, but doing it in a way, look, I'm ready to take criticism. That's not my concern. Uh, the issue is just making sure that broadly, Taxpayers uh, believe that we're taking the right process, that we're doing things transparently, and that, uh, and that they can have confidence that there's effective oversight as well to make sure that there is no uh, risk or no perception of any politics in our operations. I'm absolutely committed to that, uh, willing, to, of course, to work with you on it. My time's now up. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, let's see. Next would be Senator Cassidy and then Senator Warner. Hey, Mr. Commissioner, thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. Um, when you were, like, maybe the first time we met, certainly the first hearing, I think I pulled out clippings from the Reagan administration talking about how the IRS was modernizing their computer systems and they were about how it never happens. Um, now, uh, I've been looking a lot at this because you're not the only agency which, I mean, we never accomplish it. I grant that there's been some success with the IRS, but I keep on getting a sense that we're having something custom built for the IRS. Now, I've done a little research, and in 1994, there was the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act, uh, Act a, a law that prohibits government from starting bloat-filled projects if an off-the-shelf solution is available. I'm quoting from the article I found. Now, there is off-the-shelf solutions right now to capture fraud, to, do, to, do, to answer people during tax season. Uh, AI can do that. I have a statistic that only 29% of phone calls were actually answered in the, 20, in the 2023 tax season. There, there is off-the-shelf stuff that can do this, minor modification. But if you said it's got to be done within six weeks or six months, boom, they would hit it. Are we, is the IRS doing any of that? Well, I, yes, the, uh, it's, it's mixed. That where, where we see an opportunity to use an off-the-shelf solution, we need to seize it, and there are instances where we will use Now, let me stop. Yeah. In all due respect, when you say when we see it, by what means are you viewing? 
Well, we look, we, we try to understand, for example, where industry is using something similar. Let me give you an example. So if we have an opportunity to use voice recognition, so when someone asks, calls in, they can talk to a computer and say, can you tell me about my refund? How many more days until I get it? That the computer understands them. They don't have to wait for a phone and the computer says, uh, your refund will, uh, will be issued to you in eight days from now or whatever. That is, that is something that we have an opportunity. Why reinvent the wheel? But when you have something that's very specifically wired to having to accommodate the complexity of the tax system, like someone filing an amended return. Right now, the way we process amended returns isn't automated, and it's but a priority me, but, for us to automate it. But let me ask, have yeah. you gone to industry and asked them if there's an off-the-self solution? I say this because Operation Warp Speed was warp speed because we did a lot of off-the-shelf stuff that people formerly thought had to be custom-designed. Yeah. When I read about AI in Ukraine or in Israel, it is kind of, wasn't entirely off the shelf, but it's being adapted on the fly. Yeah. So I say that, that we're really good at software. So uh, who's making the call that this is so specific that it can't have an off the shelf solution? Or are you actually soliciting to see if there is? Well, I agree. With, look, I'm, I'm I'm in agreement with you. I agree that, uh, that off the shelf is the way to go and that in general, gov government agencies tend to try to customize when they shouldn't. And so I have uh, the same guiding principle that you do, that why modify it? You should modify your business processes to meet the commercial off the shelf solution. It's a better approach. And, and we could certainly be more aggressive in that space. I don't have, what I'd like to do is come back to you, if you're willing, with uh, some uh, inventory discussions around where we are off the shelf, where we're not, and maybe we can look at the gray area and see if we can move more to off the shelf. And can I ask you this, because my staff's right behind me, he's taking notes. If you said, okay, listen, this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to meet ideally within three weeks or four weeks, and this is what we're going to talk about, and give us a week just to call three or four different big software companies. Could you address this was off the shelf? Because I think there are capabilities out there that you and I are not familiar with and that, frankly, a government agency may not be familiar with, even at its best. I agree. Uh, so if we could have both schedule that follow-up and then get a little bit of advance notice and give us time to kind of scout out. Senator, will do. That would be fantastic. I appreciate that. Oh, this is, this is going to make my day. <laughs> um, uh, let me just give you one more thing. Um, the... Uh, IRS has decided to delay implementing the change to the Form 1099-K reporting threshold for transactions on third-party payment platforms such as Venmo and PayPal. Now, it was enacted under the American Rescue Plan in 2021, and it moved the threshold from $20,000 to $200 to help taxpayers transition. The IRS will keep the $20,000 and $200 transaction threshold for 2023, and phase it in in 2024. So can you discuss what the IRS is, now by the way, Senator Brown, bipartisan, we put in the Red Tape Reduction Act that would raise the threshold of 10K to protect small businesses. So can you discuss the IRS authority to delay the implementing laws? And um, uh, can you explain how the IRS arrived at the $5,000 threshold for tax year 2024? Yes, I can do both, um, and I'll do it quickly. First, uh, we have uh, uh, in law a responsibility uh, to implement all tax laws in a way that protects taxpayers' rights, and a set of taxpayer bill of rights is, uh, is uh, written out in the law. As a result, there have been times in IRS history where in order to protect taxpayer rights, we've had to ramp implementation of a law if it was going to e either be overly burdensome to them or potentially overtax them beyond what they actually owed. And this particular law created both risks. So we felt in, on balance in order to meet our statutory responsibility to implement the code consistent with the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, this was one case, and we've done it before, where we have uh, ramped implementation of, of a law. 
5,000 came from work with stakeholders. We worked with uh, uh, the major companies that are third, ser uh, third party serv uh, pay platforms. They were concerned about their customers receiving a, a slew of 1099s that they wouldn't know what to do with. A lot of confusion about how you would, for example, uh, calculate a basis of some kind of good that you, that you sold on, on one of these platforms. So many questions came in and we asked them, uh, a lot of questions like what is the right way to ramp this consistent with protecting taxpayers from confusion, burden, and being overtaxed. And they said, give us time. And they helped identify $5,000 as a threshold that would allow them to deal with a smaller number of transactions and customers, but yet get a lot of uh, uh, receipts back to the U.S. government. As important as the Cassidy issue is, we got to move on. The next three will be Warner, Lankford, and Johnson. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me though, quickly add, um, if you're going to get to Senator Cassidy, this information about um, uh, not recreating uh, the whole ball of wax on on software programs and updates on computers. I'd like to see it as well. I 100% agree with Bill. Um, you know, it, it just seems we always have to customize on everything in government and usually end up with products that are frankly not as good as off the shelf. And I would also add, while there are enormous challenges around AI, there's in this area, there's a great deal of upside. So I hope whatever information you get to Senator Castle, you get to me as well. Um, I'm a little surprised, and, and Commissioner, it's great to see you, and thank you for, you know, I remember when you uh, first got nominated for this and, you know, was this really where, the way you wanted to spend this part of your life? I'm glad you are. I'm glad you're doing it. I think you're, you're getting results. I'm, I'm a little surprised that we've gone through a number of, of, um, of questions and you haven't been asked what I'd have thought would have been one of the first questions. And because even some of my Republican colleagues who don't like all the money going, I think most of them would agree that, you know, better enforcement will help grapple with the tax gap. And it's been, um, most recent estimate uh, on the tax gap for 2021, I think, put it at about $688 billion. So wouldn't have to raise taxes if we could have that full payment. Uh, there have been some estimates that, that um, we could actually get a savings with the investments you'll be making of $800 billion over a 10-year span by 2034. Um, there has been some testimony that, well, you and the Treasury Secretary indicated you're, you are looking at high net worth individuals in terms of, of, um, of enforcement. Um, I think there was some reference said that there's upwards of $500,000 in additional revenue from each uh, investigation, you, you Garner. Um, can you give us some sense, for those of us who push this, uh, this kind of record investment uh, in the IRA in your or organization, you know, what do we look like, like in terms of how we're making progress on closing this tax gap and what kind of metrics on a regular basis could we see? Yeah, thank you for the question. First, I would start by saying, like, the first gap that we've been able to close is the services gap. And we put the Inflation Reduction Act money to use to make sure we had the right number of people on the phone. And, and, yeah, and in Virginia, we've gone from 30-minute waits to three-minute waits. Yeah, exactly. So that's first. Second, you know, we've made a commitment to use Inflation Re Reduction Act funds uh, in enforcement exclusively on large, complex, high-wealth filers. Uh, and we are uh, just getting started. We've announced initiatives for uh, uh, wealthy individuals who, are not, who haven't filed, uh, about 125,000 of them. We've announced initiatives to collect uh, delinquencies from millionaires and billionaires that owe, that owe back taxes. We've announced efforts to crack down on uh, something called transfer pricing, where multinational corporations shield profit and income in the US and move it to a different tax jurisdiction. We've uh, announced efforts on cracking down on the largest and most complex partnerships who are particularly sophisticated at times in shielding their income and using AI to, to spot that complexity. Um, we believe that the uh, efforts that were undertaking under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, when it all totaled, and we issued a, a report on this a few months ago, uh, could uh, result in nearly $700 billion uh, in, in return. Uh, we were debating- And that 700 billion is, is over 10? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. We were debating uh, earlier the President's 25 budget, uh, and concerns were raised about the, the, the $104 billion 
that we've asked for in the out year, starting in 2026 and beyond. And I described needing that money to make sure that we're sustaining what we're able to achieve this year and beyond as the tax system and the economy continue to grow in its complexity. That $104 billion that we're asking for would also re return about $341 billion uh, over 10 years in additional revenue. So Beyond the 700 that you've already paid? It's, no, it's, it's, See, that it's would included. Be a, that would yeah. be another. Okay. So, so that's why it's so important. That's why it's an, such an interesting debate on IRS funding, because there's two things at play. One, it's making sure that we can help taxpayers who need it. Taxpayers have questions. Filing your taxes can be stressful. The tax system is complicated. And it's heartbreaking to us as IRS employees if we can't answer the call. So having the, enough funding to be able to, to have the right staff size and the right customer service. But also, it's absolutely essential to the government's bottom line that the IRS is closing that tax gap and collecting those well, balanced dues. I agree. Let me just quickly, because I know that my time's running out. One area where I still get a lot of concerns um, with this improved customer service, uh, families who've got a loved one that's died, how you deal with the deceased processing um, quickly. Is there uh, some plans on how we can improve that part of the service? Yeah, there are a couple of different areas when you look at topics where we hear from taxpayers that it's compl complicated and they're not getting you know, as direct and clear service. Uh, identity theft victims. We've done a, a fairly good job uh, preventing identity theft, working with partners. But, uh, but on the back end, once you've unfortunately been victimized, we're too slow and we need to get quicker. And you raise uh, a, another question in terms of families that are dealing with uh, deceased relatives and resolving, it gets co confusing. I hope you could come yeah. back, our time's up, but I yeah. hope you would come back yep, with a, a plan on how you can improve that service. We will. That's one of the areas we still hear a lot of concerns about. We will. Thank, thank you, Mr. Senator Warner, Senator Langford. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Good to see you again. Yes. Uh, thanks for the work that you continue to do. It's an incredibly difficult job. And uh, obviously this week with all the filings and everything else goes on, uh, appreciate you being here on this. Uh, Senator Cassidy was just asking about the Venmo requirements that my Democratic colleagues added in in the Inflation Reduction Act, that there'd be additional new reporting on people that actually use Venmo and that there'd be new filing requirements and such that would, that would come from that. Uh, you, you expressed that there's a flexibility on that yeah. interpretation uh, based on other statutes on this. This is part of the challenge that we're dealing with right now is the flexibility side of things. Yeah. Uh, try to determine what is, what is uh, something that can be counted on and how that's actually interpreted and where it goes. Uh, sitting at that exact same table uh, just a few weeks ago was a business leader from the Huntsman Corporation. I was talking about they were doing some chemical manufacturing uh, for EV batteries. Uh, but uh, the tax credit piece, the, th uh, the 30D uh, clean vehicle credit, uh, re the foreign uh, entity of concern restriction that was out there dealing with that was waived for China by Treasury and by IRS so that that company that was an American company uh, no longer was competitive because the Chinese company was now competitive, even though the statute itself says that that's not allowed. There was a waiver that was given to a Chinese company that directly undercut an American company on that. So the predictability of this becomes a big issue. Where I'm headed on this is, this administration took out the what's called the OIRA review for the IRS for new regulations. Obviously, previous administration had an additional review. This administration took that out. My question is, why is it a bad thing for the IRS to be able to have OIRA review for regulations they're putting in when you've expressed the flexibility that you have to be able to do that, but every other entity needs to have OIRA review to be able to have some kind of review under the Administrative Procedures Act? That's a great question. Ironically, I started my career at the Office of Information and Regulatory yeah. Affairs at OMB, and I uh, am a big proponent of notice and comment rulemaking. I'm always telling my team uh, if there's an opportunity for us to go out for public comment, whether through formal channels like the Administrative Procedures Act or any way, so that we can telegraph where we're going, the better. And going back to the to the uh, 1099K, that is what we tried to do in terms of have uh, public meetings and open forums and webinars to try to hear uh, the, the concerns and reconcile them and make sure that, that we were accessible. Um, look, 
I, I know that we continue to do notice and, and comment rulemaking. I know that, for example, on the, the recent uh, regulations on cryptocurrency, we got 40,000 comments on it. And so we continue to, uh, to have that, that process. Um, I will have to get back to you on kind of the nuances of how we continue to work with OMB and OIRA. It's a different path right. than other agencies, but it's not a no path. We continue to feel accountable to make sure that we are leveraging notice and comment as often as we can. Well, what I don't want to have is when we don't want to go through review, we don't have to. When we do want to go through review, we do. I don't want to have a situation like that because then it's unpredictable again and it's once we're back again to the flexibility issues. This committee has talked about this often dealing with the Pillar 1, Pillar 2 conversation that's out there. Pillar 2 is expected to be able to take away about $120 billion from American taxpayers. The Finance Committee in particular has asked the Treasury to say, are you really going to go around this committee and cut out $120 billion? And we're still getting this push and pull back and forth with Treasury on it. So we're interested in what is predictable and what is consistent. If I can move on to a couple of the quick things on it. One is, as, as you and I have talked about before, I work a lot on charitable giving. Uh, this is an issue that I think is important that we incentivize as American in our tax code. It's something that will come up in our conversation next year when we're dealing with a lot of tax policy issues. But it's an area that we do need to get some insight from the IRS on what has happened in charitable giving. It is our understanding that after we stopped incentivizing charitable giving through our tax code, we had a dramatic drop in this. Uh, in charitable giving across the country, uh, which hurts our nonprofits, which hurts that big safety net. We want to be able to get more information from you on that. We'll follow up on that in the days ahead. We're also working a lot on the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Obviously, that's coming up next year for bonus depreciation. We're in a lot of debate right now on it. But it was interesting to me on this that we've seen uh, such conservative bastion locations as Harvard, Princeton, University of Chicago currently recently put out a study saying that based on some of the business tax pieces that were done, there was a 20% increase in investment and also an increase in taxes that are actually coming in. My question is, there is this conversation that's happening out there about trying to raise business taxes again. Based on this study that I'm sure you've seen and others that are out there, are we continuing to see more investment in business now than what we saw years ago? Senator, that is a, a question that I need to get back to you on in particular because uh, it's more in the domain of treasury and tax policy, uh, and I don't want to get out in front of them, but I will coordinate with my treasury colleagues and get back to you on the answer to that right, question. Thank you. Time of the gentleman's expired. We're just going to keep going because I know uh, the commissioner's got a schedule. Uh, Senator Cardin's going to help. I'm going to run and go vote, but we'll just keep going. Next will be... Uh, in order of appearance, Senator Johnson and Senator Hassan and Senator Tillis, but we'll just keep uh, keep going. Senator Johnson, you are next. Senator Cardin will uh, act as chair, and I'll be right back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, Senator Grassley asked you, asked you to meet with uh, whistleblower Shapley and Ziegler. I don't think he asked for a commitment, so I'll ask you to commit. Will you commit to meeting with those two whistleblowers? Senator, what I... I, what I commit to is to, uh, relying on the inspector general to run the process to make sure that the rights of those whistleblowers are protected. Okay, so so I will consult. I, I don't, okay. I'm not, I'm not going to jump in okay, front of an okay, inspector so general. Your answer is no. Last year at this hearing, there were some pretty bizarre things going on that seemed like a politically motivated uh, uh, unannounced home visit. Um, uh, we wrote you about that. Uh, you claimed Section 6103, which I understand. Um, but since then, we, we've also seen IRS agents using a fake alias, deceptive tactics, enter someone's home. Uh, we've seen an IRS attorney backdating documents. My question, have you investigated these uh, situations? Has anybody been held accountable? I, I know you ended unannounced home visits, by and large. But have you, any, have you investigated these? Has anybody been held accountable? Anybody disciplined for... Uh, these bizarre yeah, actions. And any, and any situation where the IRS uh, makes a mistake or acts inappropriately or an IRS employee, we have to acknowledge it. And we did in the cases that you're describing. We have to then fix the issue, fix the process, train, put in new controls, and then, as you mentioned, take appropriate personnel actions. I've instructed the team in all of these cases to do all of those okay. things. Good. Appreciate that. Uh, in your testimony, you said, as the tax system continues to grow, and you, you obviously mentioned the fact our economy is growing, we have more taxpayers, understand that, but you also mentioned complexity. Uh, 
Yeah. Later on, you said the tax system is complex. You know, I, I've noticed, you know, certainly in the Inflation Reduction Act, the solution wasn't to address the complexity, but it was to throw more money at the problem. You know, my, from my standpoint, I think we could do so much to help solve so many problems if we would address the complexity and try and start simplifying the tax system. So th that's my, my first question is, is that something the IRS has taken a look at in terms of a project of what would be the best way, what would be the most effective simplifications we could direct toward the tax system? And I'll also ask you, is it, is it more complexity on the individual side versus the business side? I mean, can you, it's can definitely you give me more some, some, some sort of split in yeah, terms of? It's definitely more complex on the business side. Um, so so let, let me just stop you right yeah, there. What, what's interesting about that is, you know, business taxes, C-Corps, about 16% last year of total revenue. But if that's all the complexity, now again, I, I don't have the, the numbers of pass-throughs as it relates to the individual, but we don't raise anywhere near amount of revenue, but that's the more complex side. So that's just begging for simplification, right? Yeah, well, the, 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 I, we always advocate where we can for, uh, for the ability to administer the tax code effectively. And anytime we look at a set of laws, and, and in reality, what's going on out there in the economy, we're always going to say, here's where we can administer uh, more, more easily versus not. Ultimately, it's up to this committee working with Ways and Means and, the, and, the, and, my, and my leadership over at the Treasury Department to decide what, how to change those laws. But yes, there, the complexity, it's not just the complexity in the tax laws, but that feeds different types of corporate and large partnership behavior, we're seeing really, really more complicated arrangements, the movement of money across international jurisdictions, movement of subsidiaries, the, the, very the, the, complicated And when process, I'm talking yeah. about all the problems we can solve by simplifying tax code, again, non-economic behavior driven by complex tax system. So again, I, I'm also interested in the off-the-shelf solutions. I mean, I'll kind of let the entire committee uh, know that, but again, I would really encourage the IRS uh, with your expertise in terms of what you're having to deal with in terms of complexity to report back to this committee, here are the, like, here's the low hanging fruit. This could really help us out a lot if we could simplify this without really impacting revenue. Okay, again, I think, I think we do so much in terms of, you know, closing the tax gap. Well, part of the tax gap is just complexity and people, uh, Avoiding taxes, not necessarily evading them. But again, you make the tax code complex, it's easier, there's a lot, a lot more avoidance. So again, I would, is that something you've done? Is that something you could take a we look do, at? We is certainly do it on a case-by-case -case basis, like earlier in discussing with Chairman Wyden on the ERC, the law associated with the employee retention credit. The fact that, that you can still file for an ERC into 2025 when the period of eligibility was between 2020 and 2021, that creates a lot of extra work for the IRS and a lot of extra complexity that drives our costs up. And this is why we need more funding. So yes, we on a case-by-case, on an inventory basis like you're describing, I think it's a great question. I'll go back and talk to the team about it. I'd appreciate it, because if you could find the low-hanging fruit that is just completely nonpartisan, say this is so obvious, fix this, I would like to think this committee and this Congress could fix it for you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hassan's recognized. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Cardin, and I want to thank uh, you and uh, Chair Wyden and Ranking Member Crapo for this hearing. Commissioner, thank you for being here, and thank the people you work with uh, for all their fine work as well. Um, at the IRS, modern IT systems are in critical for improving services provided to taxpayers. In past years, I've heard again and again from my constituents about delays with getting their refunds and other taxpayer services. IT issues have obviously contributed to these delays. For example, IRS's difficulty in processing paper tax returns has led to significant issues for taxpayers, an issue I know that IRS has taken steps to address. What are you doing going forward to modernize IRS's IT systems so that families don't experience delays in getting their refunds and other taxpayer services? Well, on this, I have some good news, uh, which is the main system at the IRS that is the engine for all individual yeah. returns 
is on the cusp of finally being turned on into a modern solution. And that is coming after this filing season. We'll have more on that. And what we'll be able to describe to you and the, and the American people and, 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 your, and, and your constituents is how that will impact them good. with more real-time information, faster processing. So there is some good news coming in our technology modernization efforts, in particular how it impacts individuals and families. That's terrific. Thank you. And I look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, it is something that we hear about literally daily in our constituent service team. Um, different topics. Cyber criminals often quickly convert stolen funds into cryptocurrency, making it nearly impossible for law enforcement to recover the funds. This happened to the town of Peterborough, New Hampshire in 2021, when criminals stole $2.3 million and then converted it to cryptocurrency. Following this cyber attack, I pressed your predecessor, Commissioner Reddig, on how the IRS can help combat this kind of cybercrime. He sent me a letter recommending stronger know-your-customer requirements for cryptocurrency exchanges. Commissioner, in your view, how could strengthening these requirements help recover stolen funds after a cyber attack? Yeah, I agree that that uh, that there, there's a a chain of events that occurs, and people along that chain of event need to need to know what's going on. Yeah. And uh, outside of crypto, for example, uh, suspicious activity reports by financial institutions right. or brokers are a critical uh, unlock for law enforcement to understand where these activities are. That is not mature yet in the crypto space and with the yeah. crypto brokerages. So I completely agree that's a place to focus. Okay, thank you. And last question. Um, last year, I led a bipartisan push with Senators Wyden, Grassley, and Lankford for the IRS to address possible tax scams fueled by artificial intelligence. One concern that we raised is that scammers can target seniors and small businesses with convincing AI-generated emails that claim to be from the IRS. What trends in possible AI-generated tax scams has the IRS seen so far this filing season? Well, first of all, we've seen an increase across the board, and our private sector partners, tax preparers, are also reporting an increase. A lot of uh, IRS impersonation, a lot of uh, very sophisticated behavioral science to understand what, for example, will uh, convince uh, an elderly person to pull out their credit card and pay a, a fake tax debt. Yeah. Uh, we have to solve this through uh, a combination of things. Awareness campaigns can help. One thing, uh, Senator, um, I uh, participated in an international tax summit, asked my uh, fellow commissioners around the world uh, yeah. the same question. One of the one of the big fixes that is out there that has helped is putting into an individual's online tax account the basic flag of whether the IRS or the tax authority is trying to reach you. Okay. Uh, some of our, our, our uh, uh, peer nations have really disrupted AI impersonation by encouraging their citizenry to come to your tax account and see whether it's us that are really trying to reach you. We have plans for next filing season to include such a flag in people's online accounts. Okay, that is very helpful because in response to our letter, I, I think this is along the same lines. You said that the IRS was adding online tools that would allow taxpayers to verify that Yes. So this is what you're really talking about. Yeah, but we also have to educate people. They have to sign up for their online accounts and not panic when someone calls claiming to be the IRS. Okay. And so what is the IR where is the IRS in getting these online tools up and running to protect taxpayers against these scams? And this is a big priority for next filing season. It's a combination of that flagging, but also kind of a one-stop shop for taxpayers. All the notices that you may have gotten. Many taxpayers will have none. Yeah. I mean, this is the this is what's what's really interesting. It's yeah. like you get a, a text, you get a, a, a an email, you get a phone call, uh, and 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 your neighbors got the same one. Your work colleagues, the vast vast majority of of taxpayers are not going to hear from us. So it's really about educating. But we are working to make sure that by next filing season, we have these tools in place. In the meantime, we're double downing on awareness campaigns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Tillis is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Werfel, but would you introduce the lady who's sitting behind you who's been working for the IRS for 53 years? Diane Grant. Thank you for your decades of service. Um, and she's also from Tennessee, Senator Blackburn. I think we mentioned that Manchester. earlier. 
Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Werfel, uh, quick, uh, I, I don't expect you to have an answer for it. If you do, it wouldn't surprise me, but I wouldn't expect it. Can you give me to date the fully burdened cost of the free filing uh, system implementation? I wouldn't want to do that, Senator, only because the pilot is still running as I'm sitting here. Yeah. So it would be premature, I didn't but expect it. within days, like I would like a, by the end also, of April. I also not, I, I don't want just the IRS internal cost. I want fully burden so Understood. other yep. actors I, so that uh, we really understand the, yep. the nature of the investment. Uh, a, qu a quick question on that as the pilot's moving forward. Uh, I think that you all are implementing an API that automatically loads uh, AGI, uh, adjusted ER. gross income, yeah. something the industry and some of the free filing alliances asked for for years. What's the posture of the, uh, of the agency in providing that API to authenticate at third parties? We, I, I will look into that. I mean, we were looking, we were talking to taxpayers who were using mm -hmm. the uh, direct file solution, and there was some confusion around how to get to your AGI amount, which yeah. is a key moment in your tax filing process from the previous year, absolutely willing to talk. Those, those partners, our, our, our partners in who provide those commercial software, we work very closely with them. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I, I just They're think terrific. If, yeah, it's yeah. A, if it's a tool that's going to be available to free filing, uh, we can deal with whatever uh, privacy security concerns yeah. uh, that there may be, but it, it doesn't uh, seem fair or appropriate to have that additional step. Um, and uh, we will you know, look into I, for it, one, sir. I for one hope that, uh, that this pilot, this thing you're working on right now, at some point you just decide it's not worth it because the private sector options are so much better, it becomes a distraction. Uh, that's, that's my personal bias. I know you're, I, I can't believe, I was trying to figure out a way that I could ask this question that wouldn't get you in, in hot water. Uh, but I admire your background, that's why I supported your confirmation. Um, and I've, uh, so far, I'm happy with what I've seen. Um, but I just can't imagine a project of this scale, if you were coming in and trying to fix all the things that need to be addressed or modernized in the IRS, that you would have been pounding the table saying, this has to be one of my top five initiatives in my, in, in my tenure. I mean, can you at least stipulate that while this may be nice, it's not one of the most important things that the IRS be dealing with right now? It's such a, a difficult question to answer because there's so much that goes into it. I will say that as we try to hear from taxpayers, and it's, there's, it's not an exact science, right, in terms of what you're hearing from different constituents, there are loud voices yeah, out agree. there who want this it, solution. And again, I'm not going to get you in hot water, but it just defies logic. I worked in consulting profession for years. I implemented a lot of financial system platforms. I never went into a client and said, you know what, we should just build it from ground up. Uh, we should do this differently. So what's disturbing to me or, or disappointing to me is I haven't seen a fully executed strategy on exhausting all the, pop, uh, all the, the possibilities for free filing, for for pay filing, for being able to file for free on some of the for, for, for pay platforms. It just seems to me that we could have found another way to fix a problem. And so instead of just using a flash water to address some of the problems that some of the IRS filers were having, we decided to create a thermonuclear detonation device to do the same thing. Can I Seems share like with you? It's like a $100 saddle on a $10 I, I'll horse. I'll share with you one, uh, one uh, benefit from all of this yeah. is that uh, we saw a substantial increase in the number of people that filed for free electronically across all platforms sure. this year. Two million more people sure. filed electronically I agree. for free. Because well, there so was so much follow, attention on it. If we'd spent yeah. just a fraction on the money of this platform that we're putting in place that we're going to have to care and feed and then modernize 10 years from now and so on and so forth, it just seems like there would have been a better way to achieve the goal if the goal was to provide cost-effective or no-cost filing options. There were other options out there. So I know you're doing your job. Tax gap. Um, you know, I hear people, and I'm just going to make a comment not even ask you to. Uh, I think your goal right now, if you're a successful IRS commissioner, you're, you're going to succeed in not having the tax gap grow. You're not going to dramatically reduce the tax gap because we can get into a variety of reasons why it exists at the high end of the spectrum or the low end of the spectrum. But is it, is it fair to say that those of us up here who may see a, you know, a, a half, uh, 
I don't know, let's say $500 billion, whatever the latest number is of uncollected taxes. 660. Yeah. Is it fair to say that people up here that think that's a smoking good pay for are probably not being realistic about your ability to just zero out that tax gap? It's a, it's a difficult enterprise to undertake, if, if you'll notice. When okay. we... I will go ahead and roll because I, I, I want to okay. be respectful of other folks' time, but I want to get back with you on progress with the tax gap. Thank you. My colleague, and it's an important issue. The next two in order will be Warren and Blackburn, and I've just got to tell colleagues I've got to keep everybody to five minutes at this point. We're just never going to get, get done. Senator Warren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So it wasn't long ago that the one-two punch of the pandemic and nearly 20 years of underfunding brought the IRS to its knees. Uh, we all remember the phones that weren't answered, the stacks of unprocessed returns sitting in boxes, but Democrats secured billions of dollars in long-term funding for the IRS so that you could do your jobs, and the turnaround has been truly remarkable. Yesterday was the tax filing deadline, and I want to congratulate you, Commissioner Werfel, and all of the hardworking folks at the IRS for a smooth tax filing system and season. So this year, the IRS launched a pilot program called Direct File, first of its kind option for Americans in 12 states to be able to file their taxes online directly with the IRS. It's easy and it's free. And that means instead of the $150 on average and nine hours that taxpayers typically spend for the privilege of filing their taxes, they can do it for free with the IRS. So Commissioner Werfel, I'm sure your team is still going through all of the data from the filing season, but what is the feedback that you've seen so far on direct file? It's been tremendously positive. Uh, the results of the pilot have been super encouraging for a couple different reasons. One, the product worked. Uh, second, our, our partnership with the states, like Massachusetts, the state's product that we handed it off to, because once you do your federal taxes on direct file, if you have a state income tax, then you have to do the handshake, like we did with the state of Massachusetts and the state of New York and others. That worked as well. Taxpayers told us in, in, almost, in almost unanimity that it was uh, easy to use, fast, uh, secure and uh, and of course free, which was uh, which was the bottom line that that people wanted to emphasize. So so very very encouraging results. But as we sit here and you know this better than anyone, Massachusetts is still filing. Yeah. Uh, and the pilot isn't done. And I know there's a lot of people that want to know. Okay, what was the cost? What are the final numbers? I, so we're not there yet. You're days away. Wanna, that's yep. right, days away. Yeah. But I do want to start with the fact that direct file is getting five-star reviews. It is. I take it. So taxpayers are raving. The, the phrase I've heard is so darn easy uh, that they filed on their lunch break. Uh, and best of all, as you say, didn't have to worry about fees, didn't have to worry about ads, didn't have to worry about upsells, you know, the way that giant tax prep companies like TurboTax make their profits. So, of course, these tax prep companies are kicking and screaming and trying to shut the program down. And their lobbyist friends claim that it is somehow illegal for the IRS to provide a 21st century online tax form. This argument is laughable. The IRS, like every other government agency, is supposed to modernize and upgrade services over time. But let's dig in a little more. Commissioner Werfel. Decades ago, the IRS mailed out tax filing forms and the post office stocked the paper forms, and that was it. But in 1986, the IRS piloted electronic filing. Back then, that meant plugging in phones into modems, uh, transferring data by tapes. It was real cutting-edge stuff in 1986. To your knowledge, did anyone suggest that the IRS did not have legal authority to do that? No. All right, decades ago, a tax refund was a paper check. But in 1987, the IRS expanded the pilot and added electronic direct deposit to put refunds directly into people's bank accounts. Did anyone, to your knowledge, say that the IRS couldn't do that because direct deposit wasn't specifically referenced in the statute? No. And in 2008, the IRS created PDF forms that taxpayers online 
could fill out and file electronically. Did anyone suggest that service was somehow beyond the reach of the IRS? No. You know, there was a time when the only way to ask the IRS a question was to mail them a letter or to show up in person. But at some point, the IRS started using the phone and then email. And whoa, be still my beating heart, the IRS now uses texts. In other words, the IRS is doing what all of government should be doing, modernizing and making it work better for ordinary people. And there is a big return on the investment here. The Economic Security Project studied the full costs and benefits of a full-fledged direct file program and determined that nationwide direct file will save taxpayers $23 billion a year, including tax prep fees that they won't have to pay and tax refunds that people currently miss out on. I did the math. That's about $100 to individual taxpayers for every $1 invested in direct file. It is a great investment. Thank you for the program. As, as Thank you, much Mr. as Chairman. I agree with the Senator from Massachusetts, we got to move on. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner. Always good to see you. I want to talk to you about telework policies. You and I have Please. discussed this before. And I understand that you all have a policy now of requiring people to work in office 50% that's correct. Of the time. Now, how many, what percentage of your employees are teleworking? We are at the government-wide mandate of 50%. So half of your employees are working 50% of the time. I think the way to look at it is we have, at any given moment, the way to think about it is 50% uh, of the IRS okay. is working in a remote location and 50% of the IRS is working on site if you were randomly picked okay. out of time. Have you all evaluated whether teleworking enables employees to properly work without proper supervision? That is a constant evaluation of ours in terms of are we hitting our productivity goals? Like, are we answering the phones? Are we processing? Are we getting refunds out? All of the key fundamental mission critical okay. things and we have to do. And y'all are about two years behind on uh, refunds, right? No, we are nope. up to date. We, we, are, we actually had one of the best filing seasons okay. we've ever had. All right. Well, I was asking these questions about telework because of the tax court cases regarding Thomas E. Fields, an IRS revenue agent, and David Combs, and manager David Combs. They were backdating penalty approval forms during audits of partnerships in 2022. And Mr. Chairman, I've got a tax notes article to submit for the record. Without objection, so ordered. And I, I think that this type fraudulent activity taking place within the agency is important to be addressed. And I think it's important that you are doing something to ensure IRS employees are fired and removed when they are found to be in such a uh, violation of policy and that they are properly reprimanded by their respective bar associations. Yes, and um, look, uh, with respect to the case you, you raised, um, we need to do better if we're going to build trust uh, with the American people. We are acknowledging uh, that we should have promptly corrected our representations in court in this case. I have instructed the IRS leadership team to take all the appropriate actions to make sure this never happens okay. again, just, training controls, and and to the extent appropriate uh, personnel actions with those involved. Okay, and I think it's important to note this happened during a teleworking time and without proper supervision. I want to talk to you, uh, we've discussed before also, this uh, issue of total positive income and mm -hmm. the 400,000, what is going to happen with those audits. Now, in the American Families Plan tax compliance agenda, and I've got that for the record, Mr. Chairman, uh, Treasury pledged that audits wouldn't increase for taxpayers with incomes below 400,000 in actual income relative to recent levels. And one can assume that actual and taxable income would be the same thing, but the IRS has opted to use 
total positive income. That's the sum, according to what you all have said, the sum of all available income before deductions. And Congress has not established a statutory definition for total positive income. So let's have you clarify what does TPI account for? Does it allow charitable deductions? If you are gifted money, is it included in that? If you get an insurance settlement or an inheritance, is it included in that TPI? Since there's that definition and then there's actual and taxable. So where, where are yeah, we I think, on this? I think as a general rule, you can uh, assume that if it's income, it's included in to total positive income. What we are trying to do is give a bright line, uh, an easy way to understand how to distinguish. Uh, we believe our commitment of only increasing audit scrutiny on those above 400,000 is a high enough amount where middle, low income uh, people around the country can breathe easier, knowing that they're likely well, never to- my time has yeah. run out, yeah. but when you say general rule and assume, you know what happens when people end up going to court. So we're going to have to be more explicit, and I'll talk with you about it later. Yep. Very, very good. Next in order of appearance would be Senator Young. Well, Commissioner, uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you so much for being here today. When you came before the committee for uh, your nomination hearing, you noted in, in questions for the record that uh, if confirmed, it will be a priority of mine to ensure IRS employees are where they need to be to carry out IRS's mission most effectively. Um, Mr. Commissioner, over a year later, I continue to hear that my constituents are, are having trouble obtaining assistance from the Internal Revenue Service. My office, like I'm assuming all of my colleagues' offices, still regularly receives uh, complaints from Hoosiers that uh, the local IRS offices are empty, uh, representatives aren't consistently answering the phones, and when someone at the IRS does pick up, there's often no resolution to the issue at hand. So, uh, Commissioner, I know you're here today touting some customer service improvements and uh, advocating for additional funds for the IRS. One of the reasons uh, you were put in this position, I, I think the general perception was, in, in looking at, at your background, you're, you're a results-oriented guy. And uh, I know that it's your objective, your team's objective, to make sure you uh, achieve results. Uh, I am curious what results you're seeing that in indicate success regarding taxpayer services, however. Uh, frankly, the IRS has received billions of dollars in supplemental funding, and, and, and yet two years later, we're still seeing some poor customer results uh, manifested in the feedback I get from taxpayers. So it's, it's my responsibility to press a bit on that issue. Uh, I suspect uh, you are going to quote me some data on phone answering rates. Uh, unfortunately, those phone answering rates uh, aren't particularly instructive to us because uh, uh, those answered phone calls aren't actually leading to resolutions by my estimation, uh, which is, is, is why I continue to hear from my constituents all sorts of, of uh, lamentations uh, and, and uh, uh, upset pertaining to the service from the IRS. So I'll, I'll just ask you, yeah. Mr. Commissioner, give you an opportunity to respond. Why is the IRS uh, just focused on hiring employees to answer the phones instead of focusing on hiring where uh, taxpayer problems remain the most significant, such as the processing of paper returns, responding to correspondence, and resolving taxpayer disputes and issues? So let me start by saying, Senator, I will say it here, we have more work to do. Uh, we want every taxpayer in America to feel like uh, if they need the IRS, we're there for them, uh, that we answer the call, uh, that uh, the person on the other end of the line or the person in the walk-in center 
or the, or, or the tool on irs.gov uh, meets their needs. And we have not achieved that goal. So there's no victory lap here. Uh, there's a lot more work to do. And, and, and as you can imagine, as the IRS commissioner, you know, uh, 99 out of 100 voices I hear from taxpayers are concerns. I know that a lot of taxpayers are being served well. I know that things are trending better. I'm not gonna cite all the statistics, but I know that we are answering more calls. We are getting more people into those walk-in centers in the Hoosier State. We are serving more people in the Hoosier State than we ever have served before, but that doesn't mean we're, di we're done. We have more work to do, and we are prioritizing some of the areas that you raised, wh where we don't answer the calls effectively are on some of these topics that we are gonna focus on, like victims of identity theft. We need to do more on that. And some of your colleagues on both sides of the aisle have raised really pressing questions where there are still gaps in the ability of the IRS to serve. But I wanna build on the momentum. Things are getting better. Things are improving on all dimensions of customer service, but the race is not, not finished. Uh, we're, we're gonna stay on top of this issue. As you know, we, we have a five minute question and answer format on this committee and uh, we've got roughly 15 seconds left. Uh, certainly not enough to uh, continue with this uh, line of questioning. I've, I've put on the record my concerns. Uh, I've heard from you that uh, uh, we should remain hopeful uh, but continue to vigorously oversee the IRS, and, and uh, I will certainly uh, do the latter on behalf of my constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Sen Senator Young, your point about vigorous oversight, that's what our job's all about, and thank you for it. Senator Cortez Masto is next. Thank you. Commissioner, thank you. It's been a long morning. I just have two questions for you. One involves the Inflation Reduction Act solar bonus tax credits. I want to thank you for, for making the Low Income Communities Bonus Credit Program a success in its first year. It is set to deliver nearly 1.8 gigawatts of clean energy in low-income communities across the United States. More residential solar was installed in 2023 than ever before. Here's my concern, though. After reviewing the, the 2024 program year, the current guidance reduces the amount of capacity for Category 1 residential solar projects. This reduction will negatively impact states like Nevada that have an active residential solar market, but no regulatory framework to support community solar, mm. which is where the credit capacity was increased. So residential solar deployed seven times more capacity than community solar last year. So I, I, my question to you is, can you explain that or can you address the concerns that I have with respect I to I need that to learn more, uh, okay. uh, Senator. Uh, so why don't I commit to uh, getting back to your team uh, uh, as, as early as tomorrow and schedule a follow-up meeting where we can dig into the issue and get the answers to your questions. Thank you. I appreciate that, and I look forward to um, that, that dialogue. The only other question I have for you is on the earned income tax credit. I, like uh, my colleagues, are particularly concerned that about one in five taxpayers who are eligible do not claim the credit. So what do we need to be doing? And yeah. what can the IRS do to, to reach these these families. It, it, it's such an important, the last time, uh, the, for the most recent data we have, there was roughly 7 million Americans that were eligible for EITC that never claimed it. There's a, a, a series of steps that we need to take to make sure that people are getting the credits they're entitled to, in particular, vulnerable populations. These are individuals typically who don't have the means uh, or are intimidated by the IRS in some way, shape, or form. We need to break down those barriers and get these people the credits they're entitled to. We need to do more outreach in communities, working with local community leaders, setting up safe spaces uh, for people to come, learn more about the credit, uh, understand uh, that, that it's a, a friendly environment and we're there to help them get the credits they're entitled to. There's also some work that we can do, for example, potentially to improve the 1040 form and other things that we can do to make it easier to claim. We're analyzing a variety of different steps across the, from outreach to the forms itself to anything we can do behind the scenes at the IRS 
to detect out front whether someone's eligible and they didn't claim and, and get out in front of that. So uh, in the, we're gonna be releasing our updated annual plan um, uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, we have dedicated a new priority section in there to what we're calling credit uptake. Mm -hmm. It addresses a lot of these questions, and I look forward to sharing that with you and talking, you, uh, talking to you more about it. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank my colleague, and uh, Senator Cardin would be next. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Werfel, well, first of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for taking on this challenge. As we've talked previously, it's a, an extremely difficult challenge and we appreciate the commitment that you've made to public service in getting this done. I want to talk about one area where we've seen a change in the way that uh, athletes, uh, athletes are handled among colleges and whether our tax code is really keeping up with those changes. Um, Senator Thune and I introduced legislation to deal with NIL uh, and the, uh, many of the nonprofit organizations associated with college in are participating, and our concern is whether that was consistent with their non-profit uh, uh, tax exempt status. So uh, you issued uh, a general legal advice memorandum in June of 2023. Can you update us as to the enforcement of the tax exempt status for those organizations that may be going over the line and what they're doing? Yeah, we we did we did issue that uh, that memorandum. Uh, we made it clear in that memorandum that organizations that 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 promote and develop uh, name, image, and likeness opportunities for student athletes are often engaging in what would be a non-exempt purpose, and that 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 if that's the fundamental uh, thing that you're doing, that it's uh, very likely that you're uh, that you're operating for non-exempt purposes. And we have started uh, finding organizations uh, uh, and revoking tax exempt status or not granting tax exempt status based on uh, this uh, this update. So there's there's uh, this is a new area, right? And there's more work to be done. We're at the early stages of working across stakeholders to make sure they understand what the IRS position is on this. But I would say we're at the early stages of implementation, but we have taken some steps with respect to certain organizations uh, and enforced the, uh, the uh, generic legal advice memorandum that we issued in May of 2023. Yes. You know, Senator Thune operated with me on this because we saw some real abuses of this by certain organizations that were not rewarding athletes, but trying to enhance yeah. uh, the uh, academic, uh, the ability to recruit rather than giving benefit to a person because of their name or likeness. Yeah, I should so, be clear that we we don't have any opinion uh, of good or bad on on NIL as a as, as an area nor that's new we, in the economy. It's just do it, play by the rules. It's our, yeah. our exact point. We want people to be rewarded for their, for yeah. their, but we don't want to see it abused. So I appreciate if you would keep us uh, informed as to how your enforcements are going in that area and would need additional help from, from us. Uh, I want to follow up on Senator Cortez Masto's points in regards to low-income families. The VITA program is one program that has been helping low-income taxpayers get the help that they need. Uh, your direct file, I know it's a pilot program. We expect that will help. You mentioned trying to simplify the forms. Can you just tell me your strategies to try to help lower-income taxpayers who struggle in trying to comply and get the benefits of our tax code? Well, it's multifaceted. I was actually recently, Senator Cardin, in the, uh, at a VITA clinic in Baltimore, uh, uh, seeing the good works that are going on there to, uh, to provide free tax services to, uh, to distressed communities or vulnerable populations. It's inspiring work, and we need to do more of it. Uh, we should be investing and growing uh, these volunteer programs working in local communities, working with local universities uh, to provide these free services. These are the environments where we can really connect people to their earned income tax credit that might otherwise not be. So it's about awareness campaigns, it's about working with local partners, it's about setting up environments like a VITA uh, clinic where people feel that they can come in and they understand 
the, the benefits that are provided. And there's also things that we can do behind the scenes at the IRS. I mentioned to uh, uh, Senator Cortez Masto, uh, we're looking at uh, updates to the 1040 potentially and other changes to the forms. What can we do to make it absolutely clear and easier for taxpayers to apply for the earned income tax credit? Because if 7 million Americans are eligible and aren't applying, something is not connecting correctly and we want to fix it. And it's also protecting them against paid preparers that are exactly using lower income protecting families. them from scams. And exactly. you need that authority. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank my colleague, uh, Senator from Wyoming. Uh, thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Commissioner, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Um, I want to talk with you about this direct file Please. pilot program. I know you've talked to some others about it today. A couple yes. things. Because, you know, there's been a lot of controversy surrounding the IRS is starting up this direct filing portal that could replace successful private sector options that are currently available to taxpayers around the country. You know, unlike the current uh, free file process, which, uh, you know, partners with the private sector, this would be solely handled by the Internal Revenue Service, make the IRS both the tax collector as well as the tax preparer. Uh, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act did provide $15 million for the IRS to study the feasibility of a government-run direct file system, but it didn't provide statutory authority to create and operate a new multi-million dollar direct file program. So to me, in a classic big file fashion, the IRS spent $130 million on a direct file program, and only 55,000 people, as of at least a couple of weeks ago, used the program. So the IRS spent over $2,000 per taxpayer and when you compare that to the private sector free file options, um, serving roughly 30 million taxpayers, it costs the taxpayers uh, and the government nothing. So 18 state treasurers, including my Wyoming state treasurer, Kurt Meyer, sent a letter asking you to terminate the program. Uh, they called this a solution in search of a problem. Uh, the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration has also raised some concerns. Last week, the Government Accountability Office released a report listing out problems with this new IRS program. So do you think the IRS can do a better job than the private sector at helping taxpayers? I think what we're trying to do, Senator, is provide an option for taxpayers. Uh, it's not supposed to be better or worse. It's supposed to give taxpayers options. I also uh, would offer that the pilot is not done. Uh, there have been no cost estimates. You referenced a cost estimate in your question that I'm unfamiliar with. I don't think it's going to end up being an accurate cost estimate. There are way more taxpayers that have filed direct file in the past few days, so the numbers are very different than you have in front of you. But I will say this. That, uh, that we haven't made a decision on the future of the program. Uh, that after the pilot is done, and we still have Massachusetts filing through April 17th, and they're one of our pilot states, we will report publicly on the results. I'll be able to provide a final cost number, a final number of taxpayers, uh, and once, and it'll give uh, opportunities like your state treasurer to, to react to the data and, and, and provide us feedback. And we look forward to that feedback. Good. Yeah, and I'll see the, the state treasurer this weekend at home in Wyoming. You know, and he's a big private sector guy, as am I. And the question is, does the private sector have the same, what I would consider maybe a conflict of interest that the IRS has, if it, the IRS is the tax collector, the tax auditor, the tax enforcer, and now the tax preparer? Kind of judge, my, jury, and Lord High Executioner. My answer to that is twofold. One, I don't consider us the preparer. The, we provide the, 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 the platform, the taxpayer inputs the information and makes the final sign-off. Second, it's an option. If the taxpayer feels like this is too much IRS for them, they can use any other option that's available for them, including using the free uh, uh, solutions that are offered by the software company. I encourage them to do it. They're, they're, they're very good products. Can I, can I ask you what safeguard uh, has you, have you put in the IRS in place to protect taxpayers from either conflicts of interest as well as any additional information the IRS will now have relating to taxpayers? Uh, it's the same as I just mentioned. First of all, it's your option. Uh, we try to be as transparent as we can about what the parameters of direct file are and what they aren't. 
and we uh, make it very clear that there are other ways to file your taxes. You do not have to file with direct file. Uh, we uh, have allowed taxpayers to make the final call. They hit submit. They review the, the form. They make the final decisions on what they submit. And once they submit it, their data goes into the same pool of data as any other tax file coming in. So it, it has the equal protection uh, in terms of data security. Uh, there's no real change in your status as a taxpayer once you hit submit on direct file versus you hit submit on any other solution. So when you were last year, I voiced my concerns about funding priorities. The so-called Inflation Reduction Act allowed roughly $80 billion to the Internal Revenue Service. $45 billion went for enforcement compared to only $3 billion in taxpayer services. And we talked about that in my office and talked about it in the hearing. Uh, the recent budget request, the IRS uh, asked for another $104 billion in mandatory spending of that. Uh, 59 billion for enforcement. Um, this would be on top of almost uh, five and a half billion dollars provided for enforcement annually through uh, regular appropriations. Are, are small business owners and hardworking taxpayers really going to be protected from some of the burdensome onslaught of audits if you spend more than a hundred billion dollars on auditors and enforcement agents in the next ten years? The, those are my marching orders, and I'm going to as as yeah. long as I'm commissioner. Not from anybody on my side of the aisle. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time's time expired. Time expired. Senator Casey. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, great to be with you, and congratulations on a successful filing season, and thanks for being here today. I'm pleased that the IRS continues to use the money appropriated in the Inflation Reduction Act to improve taxpayer services, and with call time uh, or call wait times down to three minutes after being up to 28 minutes just two years ago and more filing options available than ever before. I'm also pleased you announced an increase in audits of large complex partnerships with more than 100, more than 10 billion in assets and you will pursue the 25,000 millionaires who neglected to file their taxes since 2017, a much bigger number when you lower that below a million dollars. So here's my first question. Can you explain what the IRS is doing with this new funding to ensure that billion dollar companies and millionaires or higher pay what they owe just like middle class Americans have to? I appreciate the question, especially because I just want to close out my response from Senator Barrasso. My marching orders are to make sure that Inflation Reduction Act funds are exclusively used to, uh, to on enforcement of high wealth complex organizations, large partnerships, large corporations, and that's where our focus is. If you're a mom and pop, middle or low income, there is no new wave of audits coming under the Inflation Reduction Act. The audit rate you had the day before the Inflation Reduction Act, which was historically low, is the same audit rate you had the day after and the same audit rate you'll have today and the same audit rate into the future. So again, no new wave of audits. We have a lot of work to do to deal with the complexity that exists in the US economy today and how large corporations, complex partnerships, and very wealthy individuals are uh, shielding income. Many aren't. Many are playing by the rules. And I like to say that our focus on high wealth and large businesses benefits high wealth and large businesses mm -hmm. because if you're the CFO of a major corporation and you're playing by the rules, you want the other company that you might be competing with to also play by the rules. You want the IRS to be able to know which case to select for audit. By, in, by having the right funding, we can be more precise. Those that are playing by the rules will never have to hear from us if we are smarter, more technical, and more competent in this complexity. And that CFO that's playing by the rules will also have the comfort of knowing we're not selecting them for audit, but we are selecting those in their industry that maybe not be playing by the rules. And that's going to create fairer competition. And so this is really about an IRS that can do its job mm -hmm. and enforce the code fairly and equitably. And if we don't have the resources to be able to spot and deal with the complexity we're seeing, then, then the system starts to degrade. Thanks very much. Uh, Commissioner, you, you might be aware that in, in February of 2023, a Norfolk Southern train carrying hazardous materials derailed in East Palestine, uh, East Palestine, Ohio, more than, uh, or very close to the Pennsylvania border, just feet away from Pennsylvania. The township is Darlington Township in Pennsylvania. To avoid toxic exposure from the crash and the burning of the leak toxic materials, thousands of people in Ohio and hundreds in Pennsylvania had to flee their homes. Norfolk Southern later provided some reimbursement for the family's hardship. 
Senator Brown and I have been working to make sure the victims of this disaster are not taxed on these reimbursements that they got from Norfolk Southern. I hope we can deliver on this tax assistance to the victims by passing the Wyden-Smith bipartisan tax bill. But if not, if that doesn't happen, I hope that you and Secretary Yellen will use your authority to declare that this was a catastrophic disaster and that related payments are exempt from tax. Uh, can, you, uh, can you assure us that you'll do everything in your power to deliver tax relief to Norfolk Southern derailment victims? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, this is one of those spots, and we've talked a lot today about uh, IRS authorities. I've mentioned on, on many occasions that I think one of my fundamental responsibilities as commissioner is to implement the tax code in a way that protects the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. I was just you know, kind of reviewing, it's, uh, it's actually section 7803A3, which requires me to implement the tax laws consistent with a, a delineated set of taxpayer bill of rights. And I, I think that's one of the most important provisions that I have uh, as commissioner. And this is a moment where you, you basically look for opportunities to protect taxpayers because you have this taxpayer bill of rights that, that is that balancing against what might be a part of the tax code that has this unintended consequence of placing undue burden or not really understanding the situation. I think the Wyden-Smith bill on disasters is gonna be enormously helpful, but in the meantime, we're rolling up our sleeves to find a solution uh, for the residents of, of East Palestine. Thanks very much. Time the gentleman's expired, Senator Menendez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, good to see you. Contrary to the standard in most professions, paid preparers are not obligated to hold a license. While many tax return preparers offer exceptional and professional services, yet regrettably there are some who take advantage of the lack of oversight in the market to take advantage of hardworking taxpayers. These ghost preparers, as some call them, hmm. or other unscrupulous preparers often promise hefty returns, claim credits for taxpayers that they are ineligible for, and charge fees based on the inflated refund amounts. Then the preparer will balk at signing or providing their IRS prepared tax ID number as mandated by law, leaving the taxpayer exposed and potentially liable for any inaccuracies in their returns. Commissioner, what, what have you done or what can you do to crack down on fraudulent tax preparers and what additional resources and authority, if any, does the IRS need to eliminate this practice? What we've tried to do, Senator, uh, within our legal authorities that we have is lean in uh, do more awareness campaigns, uh, work uh, with taxpayers uh, on the risks of ghost preparers. Uh, th th that, that only gets you so far, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't be leaning in, <clears throat> excuse me, to do more of this, these awareness campaigns. Uh, we have put in the president's budget uh, a variety of different uh, provisions that would help us uh, with, uh, with cracking down on ghost preparers and other unscrupulous preparers, uh, new, new tax penalties uh, that, would, uh, that would be created, um, uh, de uh, allowing us to determine uh, more comprehensively whether a tax preparer is suitable or not. There are certain uh, restrictions that we have at the IRS in terms of being able to essentially regulate this space. Um, and uh, this is a spot where I think regulations would be helpful because uh, in particular vulnerable populations in distressed communities need help. Uh, yeah. They don't have the means to hire an accountant or a lawyer, I, uh, and we should be helping them. I would them. very much like to hear from you, uh, not right now, but uh, and your staff, what type of authorities or regulations would you like to see to be able to be yes. more successful in this regard? You know, I would imagine that if a law says that if you're a tax preparer and you fail to put your tax ID purposely, uh, that that making that some type of a crime is a real incentive not to do that. So um, anyhow, but I'd like to hear I appreciate your, your the question. Ideas. Last year, a collaborative study by Stanford University and the Department of Treasury uncovered that black taxpayers face over three times the likelihood of being audited by the IRS. The absence of race or ethnicity data collected by the IRS obscures the roots of this inequality. But the report points to potential discrimination embedded with the IRS audit selection algorithms. At your confirmation hearing, you and I had a little bit of a discussion about this. Additionally, the research highlights the disproportionate audit rates 
targeting individuals claiming the EITC. Commissioner Werfel, in a letter to uh, Chairman Wyden, you committed to identify and implement changes prior to the next tax filing season. Within the framework of the Inflation Reduction Act Strategic Operating Plan, the IRS has pledged to engage in research aimed at comprehending any systemic bias. A primary focus with this initiative is the continual assessment of algorithms for selecting audits related to the EITC, for example. So my question is, what are the findings of your research thus far? The Stanford report did not conduct research into potential audit biases for Latino taxpayers, but as you work on this issue, will you commit to evaluating Latino taxpayers as well? Yeah, let me start by saying, uh, as, as I sat here on February 15th, 2023, at my confirmation hearing when this report had just come out, it was alarming and concerning, and I wanted to get to the IRS and roll up my sleeves and address it. Uh, first thing I did when I got to the IRS was respond to the chair, Mr. Chairman's uh, request for uh, a, an update. I provided an update. I told him and I acknowledged uh, the, the validity of the findings, uh, acknowledged that there were racial disparities in how we selected audits for certain refundable credits, including EITC, and committed to doing something about it. We've dramatically reduced the number of EITC audits. We've made changes to our selection algorithm. We've done more outreach to impacted uh, stakeholders. Uh, we're working with the Census Bureau and others to make sure we're setting up the right uh, data infrastructure in order to better evaluate the racial disparity, potential racial disparity of any tax administration so that this doesn't happen again. The results, um, I've, I committed uh, to the chairman that I would be prepared uh, by the fall of 2024 to start uh, unpacking some of the results of what these steps are, and I still think we'll make that deadline. Well, I look forward to hopefully you <clears throat> sharing that with us, and I hope you will look at Latinos as part of your Absolutely. overall effort. We Fairness will. is a, an essential part uh, of, of your mission, so very, thank you. Very important. Um, Mr. Commissioner, you have been in that seat for almost two and a half hours, and um, I'm going to liberate you here very briefly um, in, in just a couple minutes. And in particular, we've dealt with a array of very substantive and important issues. You know, I think, for example, we could have a debate further about, you know, direct file. And there's been back and forth. It's been a part, partisan exercise. I've got to just say, for history, that's just not accurate. In that seat over there sat, at one time, Dan Coates of Indiana. And he joined me in a bipartisan tax reform bill that included a version of direct file. Now, that was history, and I know Sometimes history feels like the last minute, but there really are bipartisan roots, this direct file effort. And I'm appreciating the way you described uh, this as similar to building a startup, because I think that's very um, appropriate. And also, I want you to know, we're going to pull out all the stops to get this tax bill bipartisan, 357 votes in uh, the House of Representatives. You can't get 357 votes to order a piece of apple pie. And this is just an extraordinary accomplishment. Chairman Smith deserves an enormous amount of uh, credit. The bipartisan work went on for months and months. And the provision we talked about today, you know, dealing with the fraudsters. I mean, this is now a bill that's on offer to give you the tools to go after these fraudsters. And you've made it clear that you're not going to be able to do the job that you want to do without the enforcement. Capability, So I appreciate that. But I'm going to close with this. I've had at home about 1,060 town hall meetings. And the way you come to the Finance Committee seems to me to be almost a town hall meeting. You know, you get a lot of questions for senators, from senators. That's what we get an election certificate for. And you either answer them or you say, i got to get back to you because we don't know X, Y, and Z. And this is not just an isolated event. You've been available for roundtables. Senators have asked to come to meetings privately, you know, sessions just in the office, in my Senate office, to come and talk for, you know, 40 minutes or something like that. So you've been open and accountable. That's what public service is supposed to be all about. I want you to know I appreciate it. I want colleagues to know that questions, for the record, are due by 5 o'clock next Tuesday. With that, uh, Mr. Commissioner, we'll excuse you. <laughs>